to be able to demonstrate was obviously GitHub is fine, but GitHub itself is a centralized social network and it just happens to be run by really you know good people that, that have good reputations. But it's not ideal. Uh, let's give a little bit of context before we go into why what I'm about to show you is so important and relevant today in the age of hypermedia. And in particular, that article that I, I shared with everybody uh, the other day um, on histories of things to come. So there is precedent for this. For example, Bellingcat is a citizen's journal, a citizen journalist website that um, investigates news stories in real time and apparently using open source software um, they pull together all the facts of various different news stories uh, collaboratively with a group of people and are then able to prove um, certain facts that have been reported in, in the media or dispute them, as the case may be. And they do this by, you know, looking at the direction of the shadows across pictures to see what time of day it was. And, you know, they use all these kinds of techniques um, to do this kind of sort of fact checking. One of the problems with this form of citizen journalism is that it is still centralized so whatever software they're using and i'm not in, it's never really been entirely clear what software is being used um, to collaborate on these stories it seems to me that bell and cat seems to have this kind of very sort of anti-russian um slant to it and i know i'm all for attitudinal journalism don't get me wrong but I, it, it does it's not itself without a little bit of bias it would appear you see here they've got all the arrows and they're pointing to things um, but importantly what what is good about Bellingcat is that it is engaging and it is, it is the fact is it is it is getting citizens and people to engage in the news rather than just passively sit back in their armchairs and watch it be fed to them in this kind of 24-hour news cycles. So Bellingcat is very good. It was created by this guy, Elliot Higgins. I have a lot of respect for him and all the work that he is doing, um, but I think that we can do better. I first started to do this back in 2014 with my Moolah investigation. Um, this was the uh, former cryptocurrency exchange uh, Moolah, or MintPal, which went bust and took a lot of people's money with it. Uh, the guy that was um, behind that is now actually uh, facing um, a court, court battle. And you can see there was like an evidence bundle that I put together and there were links, you know, with timestamps to, to all the various, you know, um, pages that I was finding on the internet with evidence and, and uh, all the all the different Bitcoin addresses and so forth that were implicated. And then what I was doing was I was timestamping it into the blockchain. And so I, I kind of left that project because at the, at the time it, it was, you know, there were other things that I had to do and all I really wanted to do with this project was just demonstrate what was possible. But now what, what we're doing, thanks to Sharneen and also the, the full node project is we're actually going to demonstrate to you how this can finally be decentralized so that anyone with a full node will be able to download um, uh, Sharnin's uh, work. In fact, you can do that in the description below if you're running IPFS. You can actually do an IPFS get command. It will pull all of her work to your local computer and then you can then choose to pin um, that that hash and, and that folder so that then you can serve it out to other people. And the more people that do that across the network, the more, um, the more difficult it is for any kind of government agency or any corporation to start censoring that information. Because once it's been said, it can't be unsaid. It can't be removed again which is important for freedom of speech because the underlying assumption here is that the answer to freedom of speech is more speech. If there's something that is said that is untrue, the, the, the answer is not to try and delete it or remove it. The answer, I put it to you, is to have more speech on top to nuance what came before. Uh, so that's the premise. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to the Raspberry Pi terminal. And what am I going to do here? I'm going to try and show you what we've got up on the screen. So let me put this on a tripod. Okay. So we have our full node here running IPFS. Does that look okay? You can read that okay? Uh, it's a little blurry. A little blurry, okay. Well, and then what I'll do is I will share my... Looks like you just have to need a, you just need to focus it. Yeah, it's okay. What I'm going to do, so I'm in, I'm in here, I'm in, um, my home folder at the moment and we're running IPFS station. 
Now, IPFS station, I've been told by the, the developer that's running it, is still a little bit unstable, and it does tend to crash a little bit now and again. But hopefully, he's going to be able to get us something uh, by the end of February or perhaps by March at some point um, so that we can start delivering it. That might mean that we need to ask permission uh, from you as a community on the time rollout, because originally, remember, we did promise that we were going to start rolling out the pledge nodes from December in February this month. So what I might choose to do with your permission um, is to delay that by a few weeks um, to give IPFS some time to, to improve the stability of that software so that we can actually get this working for people in a way that doesn't involve them, you know, doing all of these kind of, you know, um, terminal commands and so on. So one of the things that we can we can do is because I'm hosting this story on my on my laptop, 